Hello, my name is Britt Crawford. Welcome to the first HiveDB screencast. I'm going to show you how to set up partition data storage with HiveDB in about 15 minutes. I'm going to start by using Maven to create a new project. I say about 15 minutes because I have kind of pre-prepared some of the stuff and I just cut and paste it in, but really all told, with all the typing, it only takes about 20 minutes. The first thing I'm going to do is to add HiveDB as a dependency to our Maven project. So first I need to add the HiveDB repository where the HiveDB jars are stored, and then add the actual dependency on HiveDB itself. The current stable version is 0.9.3. Hibernate, I'm just going to add a default Hibernate configuration file to our project. This config file may look a little bare because it doesn't have the configurations for any of the actual session factories, but those will be loaded by HiveDB dynamically. Now I'm just going to use Maven to create an idea project file. We're going to be creating a toy domain model that could represent a mu user music sharing site like Muxtape or if you're old school mp3.com. So I'm going to create a package for our project called Sample, and now I'm going to create a, an interface for our first entity, User. Each user has all the normal stuff, email, full name, when they joined, etc. So how we tell HiveDB about our entities is by using annotations. I'm just going to import all of the HiveDB annotations. The first configuration annotation we need to add for HiveDB is the resource annotation. This just lets HiveDB know that this entity is one that it should index and it also tells it what to name it. If you don't include a name, HiveDB will just assume the fully qualified class name. Now we need to let HiveDB know which property uniquely identifies this entity and we do that by adding the entity ID annotation. This next one's going to take a little explaining. HiveDB uses a partition by key system. Uh, that's where we identify a significant dimension of the data and use that to divide the data set. So in our examples data set, if you wanted to find out what node a track was located on, you would first ask who does that track belong to and then look up what node the user was stored on. So you have to identify the partition dimension for each entity that you want to store. You do this by adding the partition index annotation to a property of the entity. If there are other values that you might want to use to look up a particular entity, you can have the hive index them simply by adding the index annotation to a property. For example, when a user logs in, we probably don't know their user ID, but we probably do know their email, and we can use that to look them up. I'm going to add one last annotation to this class, and that's the generated class annotation. This just tells HiveDB to generate an implementation of this interface at runtime, and what to name the implementation. You can use ordinary classes if you like, or if you need some special functionality. Now I'm going to create the track interface, and add most of the same configurations to it. to add the resource annotation and just tell it to use the short name track rather than org.hivedb.sample.track. I'm going to add the entity ID and since user is the partitioning dimension for this data set I'm going to add the partition index to the user ID field. I'm also going to have HiveDB proxy and implementation for this interface, which I'm just going to call track impl. Uh, it does have to be a distinct class name from the interface class name. Now I'm going to create some Hibernate mappings for our entities. 
Unfortunately, you can't use annotations when using class generation because annotations aren't inherited by the implementation. Another thing to note is that I'm mapping to the implementation name and not the interface name. This is important in order for this to work. Also, you'll notice that I've set custom accessors on all the fields, the HiveDB Hibernate Generated Accessor. Uh, this is necessary if you're going to use our class generation feature. I'm just going to create a similar mapping for track. Now let's make this thing actually do something. I'm going to create a test for us to run our demo code in. I'm going to paste in a, a skeleton of the test with just some convenience methods in there, uh, some test data, uh, just some code to register the driver with JNDI, and then just some convenience functions for creating test data. I created several databases ahead of time, a Hive database for the directory information, and three nodes for our actual data. First thing we need to do is to install the Hive configuration schema. Hive stores its configuration in the database so that it can be accessed by multiple hives running in multiple JVMs. Just do this by instantiating a Hive installer and calling run. Next, we need to configure our Hive with the appropriate indexes. We can do this by using the configuration reader class. This just takes in a list of classes and it will read the Hive configuration annotations on those classes and automatically configure any Hive you pointed at. Now we need to actually load a Hive and register the data nodes that we want to write data to. So I just create a hive calling the hive.load and giving it the configuration URI. And now we just call add node and pass in a node object. Uh, so if you look at the node creation function below, you'll see that I'm setting a logical node name, a database name, the database host name, what dialect the database is, and then the login and password. Okay, so the setup is complete, and now we can go ahead and start saving things. I'm going to create a Hive Session Factory. The Hive Session Factory is just a specialized version of a Hibernate Shards session factory that has the Hive plugged into it. So in order to create it I need to pass it the Hive URI, uh, a list of classes that I want to persist. It uh, reads the configuration annotations just like Configuration Reader does. And then finally a shard access strategy. And if you're unfamiliar with Hibernate Shards, all this is is a strategy for how to access data when multiple shards are returned for a single query. So do you access them sequentially or in parallel? Whatever. I'm used to using sequential shard access strategy, which is the simplest. From here on out, if you've used Hibernate before, everything should seem really familiar. We're just going to open a session and now everything we save within that session will be automatically indexed in the Hive. We accomplish this by adding an indexing interceptor to the, to the Hibernate session when it's created in the Hive session factory. Alright, let's just start a transaction and begin saving things.
So for each email address in my list of emails, I'm going to create a user. I'm going to save that user using session.save and then I'm going to create five tracks for each user. So if you're not familiar with Hibernate Shards, I highly encourage you to go check it out. It's a great project from uh, Max Ross and some other guys at Google. Initially, HiveDB was just a kind of a JDBC gatekeeper that you would ask it where are the records for user number 47 or product number 35 and it would hand you back a JDBC connection. But then we found Hibernate Shards and the two projects just fit together perfectly because Shards answered everything about partition storage except where do you put things and how do you find them. And that's what HiveDB was already good at doing. Well, it looks like we're ready to run it. Okay, well, green light, that's good. Alright, everything passed. Let's go check on our data. So we didn't actually get any data on node 1, just luck of the draw since we're selecting assignment randomly in this example. So we see that Andy was allocated to node 2, and he has 5 tracks. And now let's skip over to node 3. And here are the rest of us. Thanks for watching the first ever HiveDB screencast. If you're planning on going to the MySQL Conference and Expo, drop by and see us in Ballroom D at 10.50 a.m. on Thursday, April 17th. Thanks a lot.